Grey Sand and White Sand by Helen DeGerry Simpson When he had put his canvas safely inside the door, Hilary Monk went out again to watch the storm coming up from the southwest over the marsh, wondering, as he always did, at the swift darkening of so immense a sky. He had finished his picture while the sun lasted, and now saw without resentment or impatience the transformation effected by the changing light. The marsh had no outlines. There were no trees save the three thorns a mile away, slanting northwards as though they yielded to a perpetual wind. No hedges, but only a darker, richer line among the grasses where reeds bordered the dikes. The land was a monotone, a flat screen on which the light played. He leaned his folded arms on the top bar of the gate, looking southwards. The storm was miles away yet, advancing steadily across the yellow fields, and he could see the foremost clouds fringed with falling rain. An hour ago these same fields had been almost gay with light. Now they were sullen as a dirty sea, and the wind drove the grass in waves, which made a little sound like the hiss of breaking spray. It was, he thought, an unnatural country, more like water than land, taking its colour and moods from the sky as water does, changing as water. Below this inconstancy lay some quality which he could not discover, disguised by the passing shows of sun and wind, an unpaintable quality which disturbed him, and which he was constantly trying to fix and place in his mind. The wind came more strongly towards him, bending the dark plumes of the rushes, it pressed against him and set a lock of hair threshing across his eyes. He hated this wind. It was the spy sent out to watch and drive away intruders, that the parties to an intrigue might meet in safety. He thrust the lock of hair upwards, pulled his hat tightly down onto his head, and folded his arms again upon the top of the gate, almost smiling at the childish tactics of the wind. It plucked suddenly at his coat, stood off for a moment, and advanced roughly from a different quarter to worry the brim of his hat, howled against the southern chimney. Finally it came at him full strength, like a squadron of cavalry, charging, retreating, wheeling, charging again. It did not intend that he should ever approach the secret which the patient and sinister land was hiding. A week ago he had begun to know that such a truth existed, and had almost surprised it. That was on a grey day, when land and sea were one substance, and on the horizon hung low white clouds, curling forward like surf. Then he had seemed to be present at a colloquy between the elements, but while he listened, down came the wind to break the strange single-coloured hole into its parts. The sea was itself again. The sky was patterned with cloud. When he tried to make his eyes understand it, the wind harassed him, blowing straight into his eyes, and when he could see again, it was too late, and the marsh was back again. Not a field out of place. Since that day he had watched, though the wind would not let him alone, and the marsh offered a dozen new aspects to enchant him from his purpose. He was not deceived. He painted the moods, got them safely on canvas, but he knew well enough that they were only tricks of light and shadow. A series of masks. Wind was pulling the clouds forward at a great pace, Suddenly, as he watched, the grey pyramid of the town five miles away was obscured by a curtain of rain, whose soft sound he could almost hear beating into the ground 
like the sound of many distant hoofs on grass. Already the sheep had turned their backs to the force of the storm. The wool on their backs was blown apart, so that they had an absurd appearance of having been carefully trimmed with a comb. Hilary Monk lowered his head, but faced it, and would face it while the light lasted. Light was important. Vaguely he felt that it was connected in some way with the secret, which ceased to be powerful when darkness came. For this he was thankful, since otherwise he must have watched by night as well as by day. As it was, he did not sleep very well, nor for long at a stretch. He was afraid of missing the dawn, and it was necessary that he should watch from the very earliest coming of the light. He did not quite see why this should be so, but some personage deep down in him insisted, and he obeyed though once or twice he had caught himself thinking, if anyone else got to know of this, they might think it was funny. For this reason he said nothing to the woman who lived with him, to whom he referred, for convenience, as his wife, often going out into the expectant darkness to wait for the sun, or while he felt the rain soaking his coat at the end of a wet day. He wondered if it could be what doctors called an obsession, and was a little frightened. The personage would have none of this, and there were discussions. Even now, standing by the gate, the adversaries argued in his mind, so that he frowned, and his mouth took on an obstinate look below the alert and unwavering eyes. He knew how the debate would shape itself, even to the turn of a sentence. Wearily he listened as it went forward. How much longer is this to go on? Till something happens? Till what happens? Till I find out. It was an illusion. Perhaps in that case it may come again. If it does... I'll paint it, and you'll see a miracle. Are you going to spend your life waiting on a chance? <laughs> Why not? That's what most of us do. Poor fool. Here comes the rain. He stood passively while it lashed his face with little strands of water. The light was almost gone. But until the last green was withdrawn from the grass, he did not dare to shift his ground. There could not be long to wait, for already his eyes were puzzled by the approaching night. He thought with satisfaction of the fire, whose smoke streamed in the wind horizontally from the southern chimney, and was conscious that he lacked food, needed it, yet did not want to eat. In spite of the comfort of fire, he knew the evening would seem long. His vigil ended. Life had no meaning until it could be renewed. He knew how his wife would look at him when she thought his eyes were closed. She had learned not to comment, but there was no way to stop her wonder, except by getting rid of her altogether. She did a great many things for him. She was useful, fond of him, and not, as a rule, very shrewd. Besides... She had nowhere to go. He dismissed the thought. Rain was muttering on the wide, darkened brim of his hat, falling straight now, for the wind had ceased to drive it. The town five miles away was quite lost, and when he looked down at the grass by the hinge of the gate, it was grey. He gave a little sigh for the twelve hours without opportunity that lay before him, lifted his arms slowly, stretched, and turned towards shelter. The door of the cottage opened into the room where they lived. He opened it, and stood for a moment with the latch in his hand, looking into the warm, disappointing stillness of the room. Outside there was movement, water slanting to the ground, making channels there, grass beaten down and lifting again, the whole sky marching. Here the lamp glowed steadily. 
and the walls stood firm. Flames had gone from the fire, so that it stared red between the bars of the grate, not blinking. She sat by it, with her hands in her lap. The whole scene was stripped of motion, as a body lately dead. He let the latch fall, and went towards the woman in the chair, treading heavily, his boots stiff with wet. She did not turn her head. He stood by the chair, balancing while he unlaced the boots and threw them down before the fire. Then she leaned forward and arranged the clumsy things with their soles towards the warmth. His feet left wet impressions on the brick floor. When she saw this, she rose and went towards the stairs, but he stopped her. It doesn't matter. But you can't sit about all wet like that. I'll take them off. Is any wood left? In the kitchen. She went and returned with two small reddish logs. He said almost apologetically as she put them on the fire. They're more fun. He was a little touched by her immediate submission and decided that the evening might seem less long if he talked to her. It was not easy for he had no longer any curiosities about her, nor any need to display himself for her approval, and except when one of these necessities roused him, he was a silent man. He thought that it might be as well to begin by showing her his picture. He had to call her attention to it. She was looking into the fire, now crisp with burning wood. Here's what I did today. Do you see what I am trying for? She gave it her attention, turning her head on her hand. He was intent on the canvas, and would have waited for the non-committal answer he expected, if the flaming wood had not sent a spark towards her that seemed to fall on her hand. It did not touch her, and she did not move. But he was startled, and looked involuntarily at her face. The hand shadowed it, she was silent. He saw with incredulity that her eyes were laughing, and the mouth, too, stirred derisively for a second. While he looked, it was gone. She had hidden it as quickly and as securely as the marsh hid its secret, and he heard her saying the expected thing. First rate, old man. Just the way it looks. The voice, at any rate, was not mocking. He might have thought that the light had tricked him. He tried to think so. He knew her so well, but all the time he was sure, and his conviction was betrayed in his answer. The way it looks, but not the way it is. Well, of course, it's always changing about, every time there's a breath of wind. That's not the real change. He broke off, looking at her. She looked innocently, blankly, in return. He went on, putting into words the thing he had not told her for fear she might think it was funny. The real change comes when everything is quite still. She asked politely, humouring his desire to talk. Does it? What happens? I believe you know. She gave one quick glance upwards that did not quite reach his eyes and laughed openly. <laughs> I believe this old marsh is getting on your nerves. Why did you look at my picture like that? Like what? As if you knew. Knew what? He gave it up, lifting one shoulder in a kind of despair, and put the picture away. She went into the kitchen to cook their supper, leaving him by the fire. But he was restless. He came padding after her, 
and stood in the doorway of the kitchen, watching. She made movements which he had seen repeated for two years, carelessly breaking eggs into a bowl, handling a frying pan with assurance. Her short hair was familiar, no more and no less untidy than when she had first come to live with him. Last winter he had seen her knitting the fawn-coloured woollen dress she wore tonight. She stood firmly, not shifting her feet, moving as she walked her body sideways and forwards on the axis of her big hips. Her face bent down with only the curve of the cheek showing, her left hand with the crooked third finger, a slight shaking of her breast when she moved suddenly, the square back of her head. All were familiar and entirely disconcerting. These aspects of her made up something new, a queerly shaped prison that concealed a stranger, a woman who had laughed at his picture, just as a person who knows the answer to some riddle will laugh at a random guess. He was excited by that knowledge of hers. Perhaps she followed his thought, for she looked at him once or twice, and put a hand to her hair. Outwardly they were both calm, silently eating, without one glance towards the picture leaning in a corner of the room with its back to them. When supper was over, and she had washed the dishes, he went forward to meet her as she came back from the kitchen, and caught her left hand, that still was damp and smelled warm, turning with her across the room. She was surprised, and stood still. He let her hand go free. Don't you like me to touch you? Of course I do. Why do you look like that? Is it so strange that I should want to? He knew very well that she might consider it strange, and perhaps discover the reason, but he took comfort in the thought that she was a woman of experience, a new desire to be a rhythmic thing, recurring at fixed periods, like a strong beat in music. That night he said nothing more about his trouble. When he woke from habit just before dawn, he could feel her body pressing against him and sinking away as she breathed, and told himself that he must have patience. Discoverers were always patient. He moved his hand to feel the warmth of her, surprised that she could so easily baffle him just by sleeping or being silent or talking over the surface of the immense question. His watchfulness had now a double object. One held the answer to the other, and at times they were distinct, and at times were one. It was dark yet, but he looked down at the woman's face, seeing it clearly, smooth and placidly smiling, as the fields did. Speech could stir it and change it as sun stirred the fields. Laughter could wrinkle it as wind wrinkled the grasses on the marsh. He moved away from her carefully so that she should not wake, for while she slept the secret was safely locked away and he was not tempted by it. He got out of bed and furtively dressed to be ready for the dawn when it came. It came with admirable, slow dignity into a sky swept clear by the night wind. The misted fields revealed themselves. They lay open to the sun, blandly, without guile, while the sheep which had crowded together during the night began to wander apart from the flock, one by one, to find new patches where they might feed. For here the tough sea grasses lay on the green like drifts of grey sand, at such a moment, Hilary Monk distrusted his vision, and would have been glad to abandon the search. This first hour of light was so sane, it laughed at him, not as she had laughed, but rather tenderly, mocking, inviting him to be happy, 
In the beginning he had almost been taken in by this pleading, and only remembered just in time the innumerable masks, the sly thrusts and whisperings of the wind. After ten days he could remain unmoved by the gentle promise of the morning. There were gulls hovering above the grass, looking surprisingly big as they wheeled and settled. He noticed that when they came to rest on the ground they did not stride about as crows do, nor hurry like thrushes. They stood in one place, shifting their feet, as though they were used to feel a yielding surface under them. They trod the ground for a moment as though it had been water, and were off again, dipping, soaring, turning sideways to feel the grass tickling the tips of their wings, sweeping above the sheep who disregarded them, or, when they came too near, stood nervously with heads erect to face them. The birds were indignant to find the sheep tranquilly pasturing in their chosen spaces, and could be heard screaming in protest, making a harsh noise that would not have mattered among the tremendous sounds of the sea. Above their assaults and advances, the sky was darkening to an unthreatening and uniform grey. Hilary thought there would be no more sun that day, and he went out by the lane which led from the cottage into the main road, meaning to follow its zigzags as far as the village called Martin Church, which lay in the centre of the marsh, hidden behind a hedge of dwarfish trees. As he walked, the hope which the clouded sky had roused in him sank away. The wind paid him no attention, and did not try to lure him out of his path by fluttering from him like a bird guarding its nest, nor to drive him indoors by squalling and spitting at his face. It blew steadily, without purpose, in a manner that showed it was off duty. He went on, a conviction increasing in his mind that the enigma might be pursued at home with more chance of success. It was odd, he thought, that she should have made the discovery. He knew, however, that the most foolish and improbable people may sometimes by chance become possessed of power which they have not the imagination to use. He saw that he had made a mistake last night. It was always, with women, a mistake to beg instead of bullying. Even the least wise of them must understand that when a man wanted a thing which she could give, his desire became her weapon so long as she chose to withhold. Fortunately, they, women, always wanted to be giving. It was at once their luxury and the weakness by which they could be vanquished. A man must constantly demand of them, or else pretend to be indifferent to gifts in order to get the most out of them. Here lay his difficulty, for in the two years of their liaison he had not accustomed her to be generous, and pretense in this matter at least was out of the question. He wondered if a frank appeal would have any effect, but when he thought of his question translated into words, it became grotesque and towered up in his mind like a genie with a foul and ludicrous expression. Has this flat earth a life? Are these moods that I trace and set down the changing attitudes of some living and possibly sinister thing? Have I seen one of the moments in which that thing shows as it is? Whichever way he turned it, the question was unaskable. At the sullen end of day, when he went back to the cottage, he was still undecided. There was a feeling behind his eyes, as though they needed a different kind of sleep, as though the ordinary darkness and forgetfulness could not satisfy. The light was not quite gone, but he went indoors to see her sitting in that same posture, looking down at the timid new fire. She spoke at once. You haven't been painting? No. Just as well. Why? She did not answer immediately, 
and he repeated, Why? I only thought you'd been doing a bit too much lately, she went on hurriedly, seeing him look quickly at her. I don't mean you haven't done some lovely things. I think these last ones are the best you've ever done. Only, you're looking a bit tired. That's all I meant. As if that mattered. Well, I was thinking perhaps it would do you good to get away. He was really startled. Away from here. I... I can't do that. I don't see why not. We haven't been spending much. You could go up to town for a week. What about you? I'll be all right here. I don't mind. I think you ought to go. Yes. I dare say you do. She began to talk of other things. He responded. They had supper, and she went early to bed. Hilary Monk remained by the fire, smiling. He was amused that she could suppose him capable of being taken in by such simplicity, and he was content to have this proof of her share in the conspiracy of silence. She permitted him to go to London and disperse his energy in follies, while here on the marsh something was about to happen, of which she was aware. The secret unfolding. It was childish of her, as silly as the everyday antics of the wind, trying to push him here and there about the roads. He stayed for a long time with his feet stretched towards the fire, lazily blinking, not sleepy. The dissatisfied feeling behind his eyes grew stronger. At last there was no more warmth in the ashes, and he went upstairs. He did not sleep at all that night. But he was calmer, and time passed easily in thoughts of the miracle. It would explain, he thought, a great many things. And though the actual happening might be too swift or too subtle for a brush to define it, something might remain. A kind of light showing the reason why the land looked as it did, why it took on these aspects and rejected those. For, he thought, what is the use of going on painting surfaces forever? Every man in his full five senses knows all about surfaces. Painters must try to get at the reason. Otherwise there is no excuse for them. Most of them are far too easily satisfied. They go to a country and put down on canvas its more superficial aspects, together with a few of their own more or less random convictions and prejudices. Then they run about, crying that they have caught beauty and caged it. Whereas in their haste and their knowledge, they have done no more than put salt on beauty's tail. This matter seemed to him very important. He reflected that he would be the first man to understand the truth of landscape, and he felt an honest disdain for the work he had accomplished so far. It lacked, not sincerity, but vision, as indeed all such painting had lacked till now. Those pictures of his that were to come would be hated, perhaps, or patronised, which would be worse, but the little critics pass, and their opinions make the first quick prey of fire. After them would come the men who were not concerned to be considered almighty, at whose nod none trembled. These would give the final verdict, which he might never hear. He would be, to them, the man who had seen a good epitaph. The woman who lay beside him twitched in her sleep. He put out a hand to her, and she lay still. 
He felt for her that regard of the fighter for the honourable enemy. She had tried to keep the tremendous knowledge from him. No doubt she had her reasons. Jealousy. Caution. Fear. None of them mattered. He was too strong, too amply determined, and if he wondered that she should have known of the search, it was only a momentary astonishment, such as comes to all reticent creatures, surprised by intuition in their innermost stronghold. Night passed, splendid with proud imaginings and dreams of conquest. He made twenty different futures, and tried them on, one after the other. There was the future in which he walked about the marsh as now, solitary, while poets and great names waited, and came forward bareheaded to greet him as he unlatched the gate, with his old wide hat riding a slant on his head, or the future which saw pilgrims standing at his grave, or that best future of all, when trees and the grassy hills knew him, and let him come near, like shy animals, tamed. When he knew by some indescribable change in the darkness that filled the window square that it was time to become real again, he sighed, and at once began to dress. The routine of breakfast, the usual cocoa heated on the oil stove, was soon over. It was no more than the necessary delay between one gladness and another. This joy of another day was balanced by an increase of the curious feeling of unrest and desire that brooded behind his eyes. He was not impatient, however, knowing that the feeling, which was not pain but a kind of uneasiness, would go when the delicious moment came. Mist lay thick and white above the morning fields, an October mist that passively awaited the sun. October, he thought, was the best of the months, with its calm days and savage nights that assailed the trees and stripped them. October night winds were ravishes, but when they had done their work, what a clean and marvellous world remained. Trees like lace, white sheets of water in the hollows of the fields, and all the westerly windows flaming together at five o'clock in the evening. A naked month. A month in which things happened. All day there was no wind. He could look without hindrance at the faint horizon. Where above the sea lay a line of white clouds which did not move all day. He could look inland and carry his glance along the line of hills that made the boundary of the marsh, like the line of a coast viewed from the sea. Wherever he walked he could hear the frequent sound of water. A cart filled with roots swayed across the ridgy field beyond him, with the labouring motion of a ship caught in a tide. He was not nervously alert as he had been during the past week. The hours slipped by him, round and yellow as amber beads. He sat on the arched coping of a culvert, motionless, while his shadow, that had been only a dark inch or two, swung round, lengthening, towards the east, not needing to seek occupation, entirely ready for that which was coming. When the afternoon drew to sunset, he was not disturbed. He had passed from suspicion to an absolute trust in the marsh, and did not suppose that it would cheat him. If it chose to withhold itself a little longer, he could submit. He remembered how he had despised women who yielded too soon. A man coming from the lane behind him, heard him talking and laughing gently at the capricious marsh. <laughs> That's a woman, he was saying. It's the same with you. Once she said the first yes, none of the no's that come afterwards count for very much. You know, at first I was inclined to be frightened. I thought that what lay underneath could be nothing very good, but I only had a moment's glimpse. I, I couldn't see. And there was the wind. 
This is the first day's peace we've had together. It's been good. But it isn't knowing you. Not as I want to know you. She tried to send me away. She suspected. We must be gentle with her. She understands, partly. Well, today's over, and I've had nothing from you. <laughs> she needn't have worried. She was standing at the gate when he reached it, standing as she always did, with her arms folded on the top bar, looking across the field to the apex of the distant town. As he came up to her, she said, What a day! Looking at her very seriously, he answered, Yes. She went on, Doesn't seem to have done you much good. It isn't over yet, he said, smiling in a tolerant sort of way, and went past her into the house. She came after him slowly, puzzled by his appearance, and that smile, wondering what she could do. Something suggested itself. Would you like some tea now, instead of waiting? I don't mind. Yes, all right. While she moved about in the kitchen, he stood by the window. When the tea was ready, he took his cup to the window and drank it, standing there, incredulously becoming conscious that the light was going, was almost gone. At last he could not pretend to hope any longer. The day was over. She heard him sigh as he pulled the red curtains together. In bed that night he was restless. His thoughts no longer moved in splendour to the tune of immortal homages. They twisted away from him when he tried to face them at the future and ran murmuring into the dark corners of his mind, where he could not hear what they were saying. He tried to lay the whole position before them in a reasonable way, but they howled him down, beating and surging behind his eyes, just where he most needed rest, and nothing articulate emerged from their clamour but the single phrase, No use waiting. Why not? he asked. What other way is there? The thoughts hesitated, as though they could have answered, but would not yet. And when he pressed them, they began to howl again, so that he was afraid to ask any more questions, and afraid to sleep, lest he might miss something. The night seemed long. He was glad when morning came, and his senses had something to do. For some reason he chose that day to walk towards the sea. As a rule he hated the shingle, which yielded and sank at each step with small grinding noises, and the dunes of white sand continually being shifted and built into other shapes by the sea wind. Today he came to it as to a refuge. He climbed one of the dunes, with sand streaming into his shoes and sat down to be free for a while from the interrogation of the fields. He offered the sand and shingle to his thoughts. The sand was very white, bleached, he supposed, by salt water and the sun. It lay in smooth drifts, dimpled here and there, and behind it the shingle was gathered, a flat, invariable stretch of rounded pebbles, over which the sea had once had power. The pebbles were three or four feet deep. They smothered the earth so that no grass could thrive to bind the sand. Each year after the big tides, these stones received reinforcements from the sea, which swept away the barriers of sand and deposited more stones. Then it built up the sand again, and the beach was rough with occasional pebbles which had proved too heavy to be carried beyond it by the force of the water. Idly, Hillary worked his stick between the stones, and levered up others from the layer beneath. They were dry, coloured dull grey and brown, not to be distinguished from that had been above them. 
It occurred to him that there could be no better hiding place than this very shingle, for something which need never be found again. There would be no way of marking the spot, except perhaps by a pattern of stones. A cairn would soon be blown down, or else levelled. The vague outlines of the dunes altered from day to day. The hidden thing would be more securely forgotten with each new tide. He had the idea of burying immediately a shilling with which his left hand had been playing, a gift to the sea or land, whichever chose to claim it, a recognition of their long patience with men, a kind of sacrifice. At that word, all the thoughts began to leap and yell in his head, just behind his eyes. He sat stunned, unwillingly listening. At last, when they became too insistent, he laughed and spoke aloud, landwards. Old as all that, are you? He began to understand what they meant when they said that waiting was useless. The patience of one man could not match the huge patience of the land, though he gave his life to it. But this other idea was more tolerable. Old memories revived. Fragments of books he had put aside since his school days. Rams and bulls and cocks were acceptable, he supposed. And there must be formulas which he could not recall. A bull was beyond his means, Besides, with so large a beast and a celebrant so inexperienced, the ceremony might not proceed according to plan. He was unwilling to search with a knife the throat of one of those rams, who, with the flocks they governed, made the whole riches of the ungenerous marsh. A cock, however, was not out of the question. There was one in particular, a black creature which he had often seen parading in the early sun, gripping the earth with strong talons while he acknowledged the new day. Hilary looked carefully and long at the idea, and was not displeased by it. It possessed and soothed his mind so that he lay back full length with his hat pulled down at the back to meet his collar and protect his neck from the sand, in a kind of abandonment of the senses that had nothing to do with sleep. The seabirds soared over him, crying. He could just hear the wash of waves retreating. A calm sky was set with grey and yellow clouds, shaped like fields, almost rectangular, with thin lines of blue that might have been water running between them. He regarded them curiously as they passed above him in unvarying formation and thought of fields seen from a slowly moving train. But on the whole, he was tired of this eternal masquerading. It was unsatisfying. Real things might be hateful or terrible, but they satisfied. They were bedrock, the final statement. He was tired of questions. It was hardly four o'clock when he stood up, stretched, and decided to go back to the cottage, not so very far away across the zone of sand and shingle. Occupation awaited him there, something different. He felt no wish to use the skill of his hands in the accustomed way, for it meant thinking, and that in turn meant the noise of thought too near his eyes. It would be good to smoke. He was surprised to find that he, who all his life had been unaware of the hours, should now be intolerant of the mere dead weight of time that hangs between decision and action. And he imagined that his life must until now have been running along the surface of things. He could recollect no previous emotion or desire which had been strong enough to make him impatient. He had loved women, but they had never kept him waiting. He was not the temperament that longs for happiness, grasps it, and longs again for some new satisfaction. Things came to him, and he possessed them, discovering in the moment of possession that they were the things he wanted. Until he had achieved, he was indifferent. The cottage, when he reached it, was empty. 
She had gone off on her bicycle to visit some neighbours a mile away along the road not long ago, for the fire was piled with coal through which rose thick, yellowish smoke. Her absence brought things nearer, halved the weight of time. He had made up his mind to wait till she was asleep. That would have meant midnight or after. But his luck, that thing in him which could compel opportunity, was with him still. He began at once to make preparation. First he looked for a knife, and found in the middle drawer of the dresser the very instrument. A black-handled thing with a pointed triangular blade which she used in the kitchen. It was not very sharp. While he hunted for the steel, he remembered that it might be as well to secure the black cockerel at once. He could see it stalking in the yard, holding its head high, and looked about with a questing, haughty stare. Going out, he cornered and caught it without difficulty, and came back to the kitchen, carrying it tucked in his left arm with his hand round its throat. It struggled and fluttered noisily to the floor, where it strode to and fro, suspiciously turning its head to watch as he continued his vain hunt for the steel. He would not waste more time. He shut the window to keep the bird safe, and took his knife to the living room, to the smooth hearthstone, and crouched there, stroking the blade backwards and forwards across it with a twisting movement of his wrist. A sound came to his ears. The light, deliberate steps of the cockerel. It had followed, and stood inquisitively surveying him. There must have been another sound besides, but he had begun again to scrape at the stone. When her voice sounded close behind him, he leapt up sideways, holding the knife back as though to strike with it. She had said, What are you doing with my knife? As he turned, and she could see his face, she ceased to smile. She stood rigidly, looking at him with eyes wide open. He wondered at her expression, and answered, it's for something I've got to do. She stared at him still, and he began to feel oddly helpless, as though her eyes were weaving strong ropes to hold him. He wanted to escape. He wanted just to walk past her in the most ordinary way, but could not. She did not speak. He implored her, Why don't you let me alone? It's getting late. She watched him steadily, as he stood awkwardly before her, his head hanging, looking up from under his lock of hair. His hand held the knife pressed backwards, so that he could feel the blade flat and hard along his forearm. Time was passing. The light was slipping away. He began to sweat and to whine, in an agony lest he might, after all, have to wait more endless hours. Let me go. There's only just time. They want me to do it. Honest. Truly. It's to please them. If I have to wait, something may have happened. It's behind my eyes. Something. If I do this, they'll tell me. I only just want to know. I tell you, it's getting late. The black cockerel, with a sudden gasp and rustling of feathers, scrambled to the window sill and out into the darkening yard. The unexpected sound made her start, and for a second her eyes were not steady. Hilary saw his chance. In a desperate rage of fear, knowing that she would not let him go, he gathered all his strength into one blow and ran past her with his head down, blindly pushing her from him as she fell. He wrenched at the door, and when the latch did not yield immediately, he beat with his hands against it, in a panic, lest even now she should prevent him. It opened, and he stumbled through into the air. As it rushed cold into his lungs, he apprehended something. He looked inquiringly at the rounded horizon, and laughed with understanding. 
shaking his head reproachfully at the immense waiting sky. Then he noticed the fields. The fields had been colourless and very smooth. Now, though no wind troubled them, they began to toss and sway in tiny patches which seemed always to move nearer, never to attain. These patches were continually being broken and reformed. They advanced angrily. Beneath them were depths. The strange fields were gold. They hated to feel life moving above them. They hated the colour of warm things. They stirred passionately the rebellious lashing fields against the men and cattle that walked on them in safety. The opaque green of grass, the square houses that should have been narrowed to a keel. They came piling and smashing forward in a fury, and the sky had curled itself down so that it lay flat, withdrawn as if to spring. Hilary Monk waited, seeing it happen from the tail of his eye. At last, when the furthest sky had darkened and contracted unbearably, and the sound of the fields grew thunderous, he jerked the door open and went in. She was lying on the floor, with her head drawn down to her shoulder, sideways, as though she had tried by that natural pressure to hold together the edges of the wound. She did not move, and Hilary had no time for her. He groped in one corner for a canvas, found his brushes near, and the tubes of colour, and sat down to paint. The room was completely dark. He fumbled a good deal at first, and had to find his way about the canvas by touching with his fingers. But evidently, it had to be done soon before he could forget. And it was not the kind of picture that could very well be painted by daylight. He sat working at it, all night, unaware of noises in the quiet house. Today's story was Grey Sand and White Sand by Helen DeGerry Simpson. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. I hope you enjoyed it, and until next time, sweet dreams. <laughs>